Have you ever wanted to go to a new place in God in a new level and maybe get to know Him just a little bit more? How do you do that? It's very simple. It's called intimacy with God. And today we're going to dive deeper right here on Revival Radio TV on just how to do that. In every generation, there have been revivals, massive moves of the Spirit that changed the course of history. In every revival, there were believers like you who chose to answer the call, to become the one in their generation. Discover your call to be the one in your generation. We're about to take you face to face with history. Guys, we're talking about intimacy. Glad you're with me. And again today, Pastor Greg Stevens, Linda Lane, we're going to talk about a fun topic. And today, I want you to get your Bible and your notebook and whatever else you need to take notes. <laughs> Hit the DVR record um, and, and take some notes today because we're going to get into one of my favorite subjects, and that is something that's so needed in the church, which sounds kind of funny, but it's so needed, and that is, guys, intimacy with God. What does that really mean? So before we get into it, I want to read scripture, and then I know you've got a definition that I want you to start off with, and uh, that is in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 and 10. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now you got that? Love him. So verse 10 tells you what it is. God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit, for the spirit searches all things and the deep things of God. Mm -hmm. Greg, what's a deep thing? Well, first of all, to define intimacy, because I, I have to define everything. That's just yes, what I, I am. You're so a teacher I, in you. I, I, I want to know what I'm dealing with. Intimacy, and just in the regular dictionary, says close familiarity, close. And that's what happens with revivals, isn't it, Gene? Yeah, sure. The spirit gets close, or we get close to him. We're not talking cyber relationships here. No, affection and confidence. Yeah. You once you begin to get close to him, you have a confidence in him. All right. And that he is who he said he is, and he'll do what he said he'll do. Exactly right. And so, okay, Greg, let's take that next in verse 10, 2 Corinthians or 1 Corinthians 2. The deep things of God. That's where I always want to be. But what is the deep things of God? It's revealed as you get close. For example, with Peter, Peter, he, Jesus asked him one day, who do men say that I am? And they began to say this and that and the other. And then Peter said something. He said, you are the Messiah, the son, you are the son of the living God. And he said, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. So that's one of the deep things. Mm. It, this came up out of his spirit, man. It wasn't something he thought of. It, it right. came up from that intimacy and that fellowship yeah. and the things that he had seen and things that he had witnessed and things that he'd, he had handled himself. It, that's what happened. And, you know, that's really kind of the crux of what we're talking about today. You know, you can have principles of faith. You can have principles of peace, principles of prosperity, but the principles don't take the place of the person. That's true. John Wimber said... If you want to have a time where the earth moves, the glory comes down, you have to breathe Jesus. Yeah. And, what, and breathing Jesus means a lot of different things. But, you know, I, I, I like what he said, and if I remember right, in that quote, it says, you can't be intimate with someone you don't know. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, if I never, you know, my wife, Terry, you've seen her. We, if I'm not, if I come home and go straight to my bedroom and go to bed, you know, and do that every night, sooner or later, our relationship is going to suffer. <laughs> you know, because they're like, hey, I don't even know you. What are you thinking? What's going on? And I, you can't just kind of like, hey, let me tell you, here's a list. This is what's happening. You know, that's not real communication. That's not intimacy. That's just a list. So understanding and being intimate with God is spending that time. And you and I were talking earlier, Greg, about not just li not just giving God your your grocery list of all those things that you want. It's hearing back. Kenneth Copeland said this. He said, "You haven't prayed until you've listened." And I really like that. Yeah. Because we don't just go in there. I mean, and say 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 this, and then never wait for His response. You have to wait for right. His response to listen to Him. The, the, there's seven principles of intimacy, and, and the number one is knowledge. And you just mentioned it. 
you have to have a knowledge of that person. You have to build a knowledge of that person. Proverbs 30 verse 3 mm -hmm. in the Passion Translation says, I've yet to learn that wisdom that comes from the full and intimate knowledge of you, the Holy One. There's a, there's a wisdom that comes from having a knowledge of Him. It's, but Gene, you, you touched on a minute ago with faith. It's not just knowledge here. Okay. It's experiential knowledge, the spending time with that person. Well, that's what all of our intercessors, I mean, anytime you have a revival, you have intercessors, you have people who have, have taken the time to break up that fallow ground, but they also take that time to get to know God. You know, Frank Bartleman, he started off and he, he didn't even have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He's out there just praying and, and everyone in the whole neighborhood can hear him praying and wailing and crying and everything else. But then when he gets the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it takes him to a whole different realm. And now all of a sudden they're hearing all of this these tongues are seeing miracles happen. They're, it's just it's just completely different. So a lot of people know a lot of facts about him, but it's not just knowing facts. It's knowing his way. It's knowing his voice. My sheep know my voice and know that they'll not listen to it. You know, there's, there's a book, and I, I don't normally hold up books because everybody thinks that's the only book I'm promoting, but this book is a book. Pastor Terry has some great material on prayer that you can get on, on our website. But awesome this is a DVDs. book... Yeah, and DVDs, CDs, teachings. Um, this book from by Lynn Hammond, it's, it's an older book called The Master is Calling. It's, uh, it's a book that I read and I got, I, you know, there are some books that just kind of like meet from the time you open the, the first page, you know, you're like, oh man, this is great. But it, she's talking about what real prayer and spirit-led prayer really is. And that's that, that's that intimate place that you don't get by reading your list and going down. So why, why are we talking about all of this? Well, she said something in her book, and I'm going to say, quote, she goes, setting your mind is like setting the sail on a boat mm -hmm. and getting your prayer life in order is, you know, you can go a certain direction, but when you, and let the wind blow it along, but it's the Holy Spirit prompts us exactly. It laser focuses exactly where you want to go and your purpose for getting there. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to talk about. I mean, every revival that we talk about, whether it was in the 1500s to today, there's an element of prayer, but as well as prayer, because we know that by the great prayer revival of 1857 and everything else in history that we've read, there's a place where there's a total surrender to the Holy Spirit. And usually, Greg, that means it's outside our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. It's outside our denominational lines. It's outside everything because if true surrender and giving Holy Spirit place to move is a place, it's a little frightening, but that's where there's the most peace. And that's where point number two of intimacy is interdependence. And so what does that mean? It means let's set our sail. So somebody has to put the sail up so that the wind can catch it. But then when the sail is up, you're just letting the wind of the Spirit take you, but you're, you're holding the rudder and you're guiding and working with the wind. And that's what people do in revival. Oh, they, yes. they set the sail and they're there, but they're still, they're still manning the boat and cooperating with the Holy Spirit. Pastor Terry's prayer sessions lately, one of the, she always will do a little bit of teaching plus the prayer. And she was talking exactly about what you're mentioning here. Get into that flow. Let the Spirit flow through you. And then people will come up and they'll pray with her. But it's like, get into the flow of what the Spirit is doing. And you know, when you're talking about that flow in, the, in prayer, you can't make yourself be in the flow. It's like you ever have someone go, hey, you just need to relax. Go, oh, okay. So, you know, you can't just relax. There, there's a process of doing that. And that's where the whole intimacy part of being, letting God talk to you, like you said, being able to listen and Brother Copeland, the quote, you know, that you read us is being able to hear what God's saying to you. And then little by little, you will be in the flow. This is one of the reasons that I'm telling you uh, that was, I didn't realize it at the time, working with uh, my good friend, Pastor Benny Hinn, and I know you watch the program and I'm glad you do. But when he talked about, I was with him backstage and he was hearing everything, all kinds of comments and, oh, we think you're the greatest. And, mm, oh, and sure. I was like, oh, please, I'm just being real here. Can I just be real with you? I mean, it was just kind of nauseating. And I'm like looking at all these people out there. I'm like, How? you got 20,000 people sitting out there. You know it's not you. 
and odds are a lot of them know it's not you, yet they're still here because of you. How do you not get that pressure? How do you not let that just be a crushing weight? Because at that time, I couldn't comprehend it. Then what he would do, Greg, Linda, he would go out there and he would spend time in praise and worship, Mm -hmm. mainly worship, because praise, he would come out at the transition place between praise and worship. And at that point of worship is when we entered into that secret place, that holy place, that place where you are intimate with God. And he wouldn't move. That's probably one of the biggest lessons I learned from him is don't get in a hurry and stay with it until the Holy Spirit leads you into the next thing. He's getting everybody in a corporate atmosphere for the faith in that room because there's people of all different spiritual levels. Yeah, and some that and aren't some even, are some believers. That's right. right. And so he's getting everybody in a corporate frame and it's that interdependence thing again. He's not, he knows he can't do this on his own. He needs the Holy Spirit and he needs everybody else agreeing mm-hmm. with him. It, I'm reminded of, a, a. this is a strange analogy maybe, Daniel in the lion's den. He's able, he's not there on his own accord. He didn't choose to go there that sure. way. But he lays down with beasts that are supposed to kill him. And that's that interdependency upon the presence of God and the Spirit of God in him to just rest and be at peace even in the worst circumstance. When you have that connection to God, there's that protection, there's that that communication. Uh, Doug Bonner told me about a guy named Sadhu Sundar Singh. And he would um, go out into the wilderness and um, there's a quote about he would be around uh, lions and tigers and panthers and bears and, and, and yet he was safe. They were his friend and he was, you know, he had a friendship and they were, they were safe with him. And it was just like, that's that connection, the trust with God because we have. Well, and that's really a by, uh, a byproduct of, of being intimate, having that intimacy. You cannot be, hey, we know Moses came down off the mountain. Everybody knew he'd been with God. Yeah, yeah. had to veil his face. Yeah, so I mean, I believe that's just a manifestation of someone being close to God. Yeah, so John Wimber touched a pulse that people just were hungry for, that intimacy. And so I was in the college class at, that was affiliated back then. There was, started off with 10 people and just almost overnight it exploded. It just, why, why did it explode? People were hungry. It was just like, we want to hear. So is it, was it the hunger or was it because there was an atmosphere that they felt like they could move into? He said that people could breathe Christ, that there, this experience could change every moment of your day and, and your week. And the students, they wanted to hear that. They wanted to, to have that connection with the Lord. The class just went from 10 to 200 just almost overnight and the whole rest of the church with it. And you know, Greg, that, that's so that that same story in different ways is replays over and over. Mm-hmm. Anytime people feel that there's an inside track <laughs> to say, it, I want to get, oh, the Holy Spirit's moving over here, they flood. That's because true. we all as human beings, we have a inbred nature to want the supernatural. I saw it at Word of Faith years ago um, here in Dallas. Right. Uh, in the middle of the Bible school that morning, and it broke out into a a revival that was all summer long with Norval Hayes. In the Bible school that morning, it started with praise and worship and the students, Mm. and it went all afternoon. Wow. And then that thing went all summer long. Um, Even here at um, Kenneth Copeland Bible College, Mm. the the kids will get in there and start in praise and worship. And on worship night, we saw it. All of a sudden, it's just like, whoom hit. There's, there's an anointing for something more and, and be closer to him. Uh, the apostle John is called the disciple whom the Lord loved. Well, he's the one that said that about himself, but he was always the one you see him reclining on Jesus chest on a shoulder on the night before he was betrayed. I mean, he was that close. He wanted to get not just his hand for a gift or a handout, but he wanted to be in his face. Yeah. And you know, it's, I was thinking as you were saying that, Pastor Greg, about Catherine Kuhlman, who, you know, I'm I'm still, as much as we've studied, still captivated by her. And, you know, the quote that I like, I quote all the time was her comment back to a, someone who was asking, and I think she even said it in the service a few times about, he's more real to me than you are. Mm-hmm. And that really is a great 
quote about intimacy, when the Holy Spirit and your relationship with God is more real than the people in the room, suddenly we've entered into a dimension or a deep thing like we read. You're, you're entering into supernatural realm. That, well, I'm going right. back to my points of intimacy, growing in intimacy. Number three is care. Um, and I'm going to read you a verse from the Please. Passion. Psalm 37, 29 says, The faithful lovers of God will inherit the earth and enjoy every promise of God's care dwelling in peace forever. And the, the faithful lovers of God, Catherine Kuma loved Jesus. Well, she stood on that train station and there was that decision that she had to make. Was she going to keep going on with the superficial way she had been living or was Jesus going to be more real to her? And there was that deep passion and hunger that said, I need Jesus. So how do I care for Jesus? How do I do that? I mean, he has everything. And the way you do that is you serve his people. How does he need us? That's how he needs us. He needs how, us. how does he need us? He needs us to be responsive. He needs mm -hmm. us to care for what he cares about. He needs us to, to um, you know, it's like a, a marriage relationship. You need to be responsive. Right. You yeah. need to care, not just say you care, but demonstrate that you care. Well, Dima Shakarian comes to mind for me because he was shown a vision and he saw these all the peoples of the world, and just like you have at a football game where you zoom in on them, he saw their hurting, desolate, needing something, wretched faces. And then the Lord said, wait. And he showed Demas again, the same people, and he saw them reflecting the joy of the Lord, the passion of love for the Christ. And the thing was, is God laid out to Demas a vision for the full gospel businessmen's international. So we've had, we always know what we need, but if we ever ask the question, Lord, what do you need? Jesus, what do you need from me? Because there are prayers that he prayed in, in John chapter 17 in particular that were his prayers. Why don't we be the answer? Here's how, here's how you want to get intimate with him. You be the answer to one of his prayers instead of asking him to meet one of yours. If Explain, how, how do I do that? If you'll get interested in what he's interested in, and the number one priority is the lost with him. Uh, the number one, and then and seeing people healed, seeing people blessed. You get interested in what he's interested in, and you go and you meet that need. Say, Father, he said, pray for laborers to go forth into the harvest. Say, I want to be a laborer today, Lord. Direct me. I'm going to set the sail on my boat. And the Holy Spirit will direct me on how I should move. Mm -hmm. and, and I will be an answer to somebody's prayer today. You, you bring somebody across my path and I will be the one today. There's intimacy. Well, that's right. And I think about um, when Daniel Kalenda was on and I've heard him talking about what you said, Greg, about getting involved where, where, he's, where God's at. And there's a man that all he does is drive the tent from one place in Africa to the next. Yeah. You know, and he has to fight everything from bandits to, you know, soldiers that want something to people being just being robbed and stolen and truck breaking down. I mean, that's part of it, isn't it, Greg? Don't you think that's part of it is being able to be involved? As dependent at? upon, as dependent as we are upon him, he's dependent upon us because how, he's How is here. he dependent on us? He's not here. He's the head of the body, the head of the church, but he's not here. It's us now with his anointing in the earth, and we're supposed to go and represent him. Well, even King David said this in Psalms uh, 115.7. He said, The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into the silence. He understood that you had to be the one. You had to reach out in prayer, in faith. You had to make that connection with God. It was going to all change when you were on the other side. You know, I think about uh, what we were saying the other day where it's like, okay, now you've got this huge tent meeting, you know, 3,000 people. And, and you were saying, Gene, how you've got to be willing to start small. Except that you may just be talking to the guy at the grocery store. You may be talking to the person in the class sitting next to you. Here it is. The fourth one in growth of intimacy is trust. Trust requires unanswered questions. There's going to come a point in your growth in Jesus Christ, that he's going to ask you to do something that doesn't make sense. And you're going to have to trust him. 
whether it's sowing a large gift, whether it's going and praying for that person over there, whether it's, um, no matter what it is, he's going to ask you to get out of your comfort zone. In a revival meeting, he's going to push a point to where, will you trust me? Mm -hmm. And like I said before, trust requires unanswered questions. Elder so, Jacob Knapp, that's who comes to mind with what you're saying. Step out of your comfort zone, trust. This guy, he just wanted to do something for God. And so he, he just, he got intimate with the Lord. He just, he started taking that time. The thing is, is that when he talked to people, they accepted Christ. And the guy literally stopped counting when it hit 100,000 people saved. He just stopped counting. And that's in the late 1700s, right? Yeah, he was from 1799 to 1874. So Greg, if, if, we're, if we're really walking down this path, and we're supposed to, if his yoke is easy and his burden light, then it has nothing to do with our works. It has everything to do with our availability. So that word I used, trust, there a second ago, the very first place it's used, the very first place faith is used in the Bible is better translated trust, and it's with Abraham. And it's the Hebrew word emuna. It, it's not, Abraham did things wrong, man. I mean, he got yeah. it wrong bad. Twice he's selling off Sarah. <laughs> you know, yeah. to somebody else. I'd give you a compliment, right. wouldn't you? Yeah, right. That, that's not going to build intimacy going between the two of them. <laughs> yeah. no. but, but the thing is, is regardless of what his works were, he got it right. Jesus tells a parable about a guy who has the right heart. So what you're saying is action. even though he messed up, his trust, his faith is what did it. And it's really, Gene, not his faith anyway. We've been given the measure of faith. The faith that we have has been given to us by grace. And that's why it's by grace through faith. Or right. by faith that it may be by grace. When you were saved, tied together. When you were saved, you got a have measure it. of faith. And you, you absolutely have you it. You don't even have to get it right the first time. When Sarah got told she was going to have a baby, she laughed. And so did Abraham. They both did. But yet in Hebrews, this, it says it's accounted as righteousness to the both of them. And here's how it happened, Linda. It says, Sarah herself received strength to conceive because she judged him faithful that promised. She sat down one day and went through all of the things that God said he was going to do. And she realized you were faithful then, you were faithful then, you were faithful then. And we need to do the same thing. And, and, and I think, you know, that's the whole point is it's not by your feelings. Mm -mm. Let me ask you this, Greg, have you ever had, um, so you've been a believer for a long time even as a minister of the gospel and a pastor, did you ever have to continue to get out of your comfort box? Oh, yeah. Your comfort zone? Yeah, all the time. Yeah, he kind of requires that of you, doesn't he? Absolutely. Because and because just when you think you're getting comfortable and you say, God, I'm not tired. I'm tired of services like this. I'm tired of the same old, same old, same old. It's when I realized I've probably, I've probably missed one that he told me to do. Yeah. I probably let it slide or didn't do. There was one time I was preaching for a, a church, I was a guest there, and I got in my spirit, I want you to pray for people with eye issues, eye things. I'd been believing for something with my own eyes. Mm -hmm. And um, so I did. And then as I was going down to get ready, you know, I don't know, six, seven people, going to pray for this, there's this little lady, she's probably four foot 11. Mm -hmm. And I heard in my spirit spit in her eyes like I did. And I'm thinking, uh-uh. <laughs> Uh, and I, no. I, even, I even said, I rebuke you, <laughs> yeah. right? But you know, you know the voice of the Lord. I heard it again. And I, I, I skipped her. I said, ma'am, I'm coming back to you. I did, Jean. I skipped her. I don't know if anybody else got anything or not because in, I'm in my head now about yeah. her. I got to come back to her. And I'm going down the thing and I come back around. I heard it again. Hmm. Will you do what I ask you to do? Mary gave us the instructions with Jesus. Whatever he tells you to do, do, do it. it. Do it. And I said, every head bowed, every eye closed. I mean, everybody in this room. And I did. And I, I had everybody shut their eyes. I said, Pastor, you too. Ushers, you too. And I said, Lord, they're going to run me out of here. And I, I, it doesn't sound like a lot of faith, does it? Mm. And I, I spit in my hands. I even that told the sound people, kill my mic. And I said, in the authority of the name of Jesus, what you did, I'm doing. Because you told me to do it. And I laid my hands on her and she screamed like mm. this blood curdling scream and wow. went boom to the ground. And when they got her up, she could see. Wow. Praise and the God. story was she'd been in the Holocaust. She's a little Jewish woman. 
and got hit by a rifle butt when she was a child and blinded this eye and was this other eye was nearly blind yeah. as a result over the years. And she was totally, could see out of both eyes totally. Now that only happened one time right. in my life. That's, and not, that's, the, that's not an everyday thing, but it was learning to trust. You actually did what he told you to do. I did. Right. You know, I was terrified. This Sunday, I was sitting on the platform with Pastor George and I was, I was supposed to talk about the offering. And I'm thinking, I saw you. I'm going through my offering message and I kept getting <laughs> something different to do. And I'm like, God, you know, this is not on the format. This is not what we're supposed to do. I've only got a few minutes. I knew you were timing me. No, I probably. wasn't timing yet. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, you know, when I got up there, I mean, this whole thing was about somebody with neck issues and yeah. somebody named Marilyn. And I'm like, dear God, please. So then I'm sitting there in my seat trying to justify yeah, there's probably a Marilyn in here. <laughs> yeah, there's probably somebody yeah. named right. Marilyn in here. I was online asking yeah. anybody in here named Marilyn, and yeah. there was nobody. I'm like, oh, let there be one. <laughs> <laughs> and there was, we yeah. Thank, one, thank one. you, Lord. There was one. You know, but that is that is not my comfort zone. See, I don't when, like when that. you had the neck thing and you had different people stand <laughs> up, I was just standing there and I looked down the row on my row and I saw this man and I heard that same voice I heard when I heard spit in her eye say, you get down there and you minister to him. I was, yeah. And I immediately was like, well, there's people there. And I heard it again, you go. Yeah. And I took off. Good. I mean, I, I, I sprinted almost to get to him. But right. why do we assume that it was easy for Jesus to grab mud and put it on the blind man's eyes or to do half of the other amazing things that he did? I mean, well, he's, he's learning. He's, he has an intimate relationship with the father and he trusts him. He cares for him. He, he's but built he's a, trailblazing. This but is he's something a relationship new. with him, even to the point that his friend dies, and the spirit of the Lord said, "Stay here mm-hmm. for he, his own safety." His, and he did. His first response was, "He cried." He knew in his head what was, and he knew in his spirit what was going to come. But he. Still, but it was a trap. They were going to kill him, right? And stone him. And so he stayed and was obedient. And so when he shows up at his friend's family, they're like, "You're late. You're, you're too late. Where you been?" You know, if you really cared, see, that would be the pressure on us. Oh, if yeah. If you right. really cared, you would have been here three days ago. Yeah. But no, he was following. He'd set his sail on that boat and yeah. he was following the wind of the Holy Spirit. God has the timing. He has the timeline. He knows when things have to be done and how they have to be done. And it wasn't based upon his feeling because he cried that day. Right. It wasn't based upon his feeling. It wasn't based upon his attitude. He was just being obedient to what the word, what, what, the, what the father was saying for him to do wasn't any emotion in it or anything else. It was being obedient to that. Obedient. It's really an exciting adventure to go and see what God wants us to do and how, how history kind of unfolds in front of us. We've seen so many things. You know, my goal is to take as many people with us. If I can encourage one person to go back and see what history shows us about revival, it sparks a fire and it sparks something into the people that see it. And that brings a revival.